she went missing after mm-hmm. getting home on Monday. Chris says he went to work, that she came home around what, 2 a.m. And then he, he went, went to work at 5.15. Right. And he said that she was there when he left. Right. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. This is part two of the Lacey Peterson video. If you've not seen part one, click the link in the description box because you're probably confused right now. But anyway, we're getting back into the story here and we are starting at a very sad point in the story, but a big turn in the story. So obviously we kind of left things in January. There's no leads. Scott's starting to look a little weird, especially with his affair going on. Amber Fry around the 24th finally came out publicly. So the public knows about his affair. Lacey's family has turned on him the media has turned on him and now it is april and there's still nothing until april 13th sadly on april 13th the remains of a young child washed up on the shore of the san francisco bay the next day april 14th at 11:43 a.m someone who's just walking their dog came across a decomposing body that had washed up onto the shore this is when they found a human torso in the San Francisco Bay. So it was just a torso. They couldn't even tell the gender, it was so bad. And I think a lot of people are gonna be confused about the baby. She was pregnant, how did this happen? And this is so morbid and, and gross. But when people that are pregnant die and they're like far enough along, sometimes there's like stillbirth after they're dead. And this was major news as you can imagine. And Scott went to San Diego to get away from the media. But quickly after that, now that police have a body, they can really put a case together and charge Scott. On April 18th, Scott had plans to go play golf. And as he was driving to the golf course, he noticed that there were cars behind him following him. Now he actually thought this was the media and he was trying to get away from them, but it was actually law enforcement and he was driving like a total sketchball. They said that they were like dodging around trying to get him. He was making all these crazy aggressive moves, kind of like a low key OJ situation. And eventually when he pulled in the parking lot of the golf course, they pulled in after him and arrested him. And at this point, they weren't completely sure that those bodies were Lacey and Connor's. I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but she was planning to name the baby Connor and we can't forget he lost his life as well. So the bodies had not been confirmed to be Lacey and Connor yet, but they decided to go ahead and move forward with the charges. Once the arrest was made, they searched his car. In the car, they found some camping gear about ten to fifteen thousand dollars in cash his brother's id and not only that he also had dyed his hair like this weird brassy blonde and had like new facial hair so people started to think was he headed to mexico i mean san diego is pretty close and later that day the dna test came back that this actually was lacy and connor east bay park authorities uh, discovered two bodies there is no question in our minds that the unidentified female is Lacey Peterson. The unidentified fetus is the biological child of Lacey and Scott Peterson. And they said that when they told Scott, his emotions were really weird. He didn't even shed a tear. On the drive back, we got the phone call that verified that this was Lacey and Connor. And Scott made this kind of little sniffle. And we continued to drive not too far. So they were gonna you know, get a bite to eat here in a little while. If you're hungry, we'll get you something to eat. In and out, I'll have a double-double with cheese, a small fry and a vanilla shake. And when Scott finally arrived to the prison, there was already a mob around the jail. At this point, pretty much everyone believed that Scott Peterson was guilty. I mean, especially the fact that she turned up where he was spending his day. On April 21st, Scott had his arraignment and went into jail. And they gave him two murder charges, one for Lacey and one for their unborn son. So now Lacey's family is obviously switching gears. They are no longer looking for Lacey. They are trying to get justice for her. After her body was found, her house was just covered with flowers and cards and candles. I mean, people just felt so, so disgusted. And I think a lot of people were holding out hope that she was still out there somewhere and this just crushed everyone. So Scott ended up hiring a private attorney named Mark Garagos. We're not into arguing reasonable doubt in this case. We've set the bar extremely high. And that's to prove that Scott is not only factually innocent, but to figure out exactly who it is did this horrible thing to Scott's wife and to Scott's son and to their grandson. And when he started, it was quite the job because there were over 30,000 pages of like various documents related to Scott in the Lacey Peterson case. They looked through Scott's whole history going all the way back to elementary school and they weren't able to find any instance of Scott committing a crime or being bad. I mean, people seemed to really like him. His parents said he was just such a good kid. He loved to hug and, and kiss and uh, very affectionate. 
Just, just a really kind, you know, sweet little guy. Never in trouble of any kind. He was too good to believe, almost. Scott's parents have gone public saying that they believe that the police here bungled this investigation. And the police did a lousy investigation. They should go back and look at it again. I mean, there were quite a few people who were supporting him. His family's always supported him to this day. Now, to this day, no one knows exactly what happened to Lacey or how it happened. But police started to put together a theory. They believe that Scott actually killed Lacey on the night of the 23rd. They believe that he tied anchors to her neck, limbs, and dropped her in the San Francisco Bay. It wasn't like she was dismembered or anything. Her body just like fell apart from being under the water so long. On May 4th, which was Lacey's birthday, the city of Modesto held a memorial for her. It was beautiful, you know, so much support and kind of let the family get a little bit of closure to this. Scott's family did not attend the memorial and Scott's mom actually put out a statement saying, for the dignity of the memorial service and out of respect to Sharon and her family, we will not be attending the memorial service. We will have a private memorial with Scott and they probably just didn't go because they didn't want to be harassed by the media or people there. All right, so jumping into the trial phase here. Is that correct, Mr. Peterson? You're pleading not guilty of the two charges of uh, murder plus the special uh, denying the special allegations? Absolutely. That's correct, Your Honor. I'm innocent. The biggest issue they had with the trial was getting a jury that didn't know what was going on in the case. I mean, this was major news. People had major bias against Scott and they had to find people that didn't have any bias at all. So they moved the trial to Redwood City and Redwood City is closer to San Francisco than Modesto and San Francisco is like the media hub for California. So it made it easier for reporters. It was difficult. Like even there, 50% of the people who they interviewed admitted that they thought Scott was already guilty. And then they had a lot of issues with people lying, like knowing that if I say I think he's guilty, I'm not gonna get in. And they definitely had bias against him still, but kind of were, you know, trying to mask that. So it was a really difficult process. So June 1st, 2004, the trial began. Now there were no cameras in the courtroom, which is unusual. A lot of high profile cases have cameras, Casey Anthony, OJ Simpson, but there were no cameras in this case. And the prosecution basically said that Scott's motive would have been to not be tied down anymore, didn't want to have a child, maybe wanted to be free to date other women or start a serious relationship with Amber. So one of the biggest witnesses in this case was someone that they brought in on the defense side. And this was a computer forensic analyst. And he claimed that at 8.40 a.m. on December 24th, when Lacey disappeared, someone was on the Peterson home computer looking at sunflower umbrellas and women's clothing. Now, Lacey loved sunflowers, so a lot of people thought this was probably her, unless it was Scott pretending to be her. But this was a really big deal because this this, if it's true and that was Lacey, it would completely discredit the police's theory of her being killed the night before because it shows that she was awake and doing stuff that morning. And a lot of people bring up the argument that if Scott really did get on the computer trying to make it look like Lacey was on, why wouldn't he have brought this up? Like, she was on the computer, look, here's proof. You know, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So the timeline's now starting to get really fuzzy and basically it would mean that if Lacey was on the computer, Scott would have had to kill her like immediately after she was on the computer in order for this timeline to work out at all. He would have had to kill her, clean up all the evidence, bring her to the San Francisco Bay in the middle of the day, and a lot of people just thought this didn't make a lot of sense. And it does seem a little weird. Like, I've definitely had my questions with this, and I know there's gonna be controversy in this case for sure. There's gonna be different opinions, and I'm not even sure where I completely stand, to be honest. But at this point, the prosecution was starting to look really stupid. I mean, they were so sure that she was killed the night before, and this really threw a wrench in things. Another huge piece of evidence in this case was these anchors that Scott would make. Now, a lot of people that work with boats create their own anchors just out of cement. They just let cement harden and use it as anchors. And Scott had this kind of process going on and they found it and they were like, well, here's the proof. You clearly make anchors and she was probably anchored. But Scott just said that he only made anchors for his boat. Now, thankfully, the photos of Lacey have never been released as they should not be. I can't even imagine the condition. I would never want to see that. But in court, they have to show that kind of stuff. So people that were in the courtroom said that when they showed the picture of Lacey and Connor, that Scott had like no emotion. He just sat there. I mean, I, I just can't even imagine. I'd be hysterical. So this made people even more furious. And people were following this case like big time. This was like, you know, not quite as big as OJ obviously, but this was a very high profile case that people were trying to get into the courtroom and waiting outside. It was very, very uh, intense. Eventually they had Amber testify as well. And she played for the court all the conversations that she had with Scott. I feel like I always call you. 
I tell you, you're special. Voices of Scott Peterson and Amber Fry filled the courtroom today when prosecutors played audio tapes of lengthy conversations the two shared in early January of 2003. You know, what really struck me in listening to those tapes is how little Scott Peterson cared about his wife and child. You know, in my mind, we could be wonderful together and I could care for you in any and every way. For the rest of our lives, I think we care for each other and Ayana. We could fulfill each other. Later in the conversation, Fry brings up the topic of having another child. Fry says, do you still feel that you're very adamant about not having another child? Peterson says, oh, I wouldn't say adamant, but it's not in my thoughts currently. At this point, Peterson's pregnant wife, Lacey, had been missing for eight days. During their conversation the next day, Peterson tells Fry he took a train to Brussels. He complains of being tired because his day was very long and boring. He also complains of having a sore hip. Peterson says he fell while he was out jogging on a cobblestone street. Now these calls prove to us that Scott is a big liar. I mean, it was just so bad. Honestly, I'm not sure what would have happened in this case if she wasn't part of this. Another big moment in this trial was when Scott's attorney, Mark, showed everyone how it would be impossible to throw a body off the side of a small boat. Mark actually bought a boat that was really similar to Scott's and he had someone try to throw a hundred pound weight off the boat and every time that they did it, it, like four times the boat tipped. So they basically made the argument that it would have been impossible in Scott's boat to throw that body. So back when they were searching for Lacey, they used a search dog and the dog's handler actually testified that the dog was acting really weird when they got to Scott's dock, that he picked something up. Now this also didn't look good for Scott, but they found out that the dog actually had failed its certification test to be doing this. So this makes the dog illegitimate and a major problem with it is that they gave the dog something that had Scott and Lacey's scent on it and how that works they you know give him the scent and then the dog tries to go find the scent so were they picking up Scott's scent at the dock like obviously it would be there or Lacey's like we have no way to ask the dog which one it was so the whole dog thing got completely thrown out and another key moment in this trial is when the defense started trying to argue that Connor was alive for days after Lacey his body was in much better condition they figured that he was alive for a couple days after after she was already dead. So they were basically trying to say that Scott shouldn't be held accountable for Connor, which would make the death penalty less of an option, which they were pursuing. After talking to her family, they wanted to pursue the death penalty. The defense brought in a OBGYN, Dr. Charles March, and he said that based on the physical state of Connor that he likely didn't die until the 29th. And what sucks about this is apparently they were asking all these questions for him and he got really overwhelmed and told on the stand for everyone to just give him a break. Now this made him look really not very credible and it was kind of tossed out by the jury as well. During the trial, one of the key witnesses was named Karen Service. You remember she was the one that saw the dog wandering around around 1018, but it was really confusing because other people said that they saw Lacey walking the dog after 1018. Though no one knew who to trust or what the timeline was, it was just a giant confusing mess. On November 3rd of 2004, five months after the trial had started, the jury started to deliver and it took them a long time, which is good. It should take a long time. You can look at it one of two ways. Either they say the prosecution didn't prove it, or, of course, he's the one that did it, and we're going to find him guilty. We'll find out in a matter of moments. The verdict finally came on November 12th, 2004 at 1.30 p.m. The verdict in the Scott Peterson murder trial is finally in. We, the jury in the above entitled cause, find the defendant, Scott Lee Peterson, guilty of the crime of murder of Lacey Denise Peterson. <laughs> in violation of the Penal Code Section 187A, as alleged in Count 1 of the information filed herein. Dated November 12, year 2004, four person number six. Now the public was thrilled. Seriously, this was all over magazines. I remember it even when I was pretty young, and I remember this. People were running around, cheering. <laughs> That comes with death penalty or life without parole. Guilty of second degree murder with regard to his unborn child, baby Connor. Scott Peterson is guilty of murder. First degree murder for killing his wife, Lacey. And he's guilty of second degree murder for killing their unborn son, 
Connor. Three or four of her friends, of course, her father, her mother, her stepfather, her brother, her sister, all sitting in the front row. Petersons were there, but uh, Lee Peterson was noticeably missing. Scott Peterson's father, also defense attorney Mark Garagas was not in the room. Apparently, he is down in Southern California on attending to some kind of business or on some other cases. But when they came into the room and announced that verdict, immediately the side of the room with the Rocha family, Lacey Peterson's family and friends erupted into tears and just cries of relief. Uh, the Petersons, very somber, very stoic. Scott Peterson had been smiling and laughing and that sort of thing, you know, seeming very confident before the verdict came in. Once that verdict was in, he was straight ahead. He didn't look to either side. What a nightmare. It hasn't changed. It's still a nightmare. It should never have happened. It's hurt so too many people for no reason. But justice was served. Obviously, we're very disappointed. Obviously, um, we plan on pursuing every and all uh, appeals. And after the verdict, there was about a month of them deciding whether or not they wanted to go for the death penalty or life in prison without parole. Really, Mark Garagas' main concern now is to try and save his client's life. And there has been a lot of speculation about what evidence he will put on. But his main focus will likely be the fact that this is Scott Peterson's first offense and that he does not deserve to die. And these same 12 jurors, the very same 12, will not be sequestered. They will go home. They're not going to be talking to the media. And they'll come back here a week from Monday to begin deliberating Scott Peterson's fate, life or death. But on December 13th, 2004, the jury decided to go ahead and go with the death penalty. People of the state of California versus Scott Peterson, we the jury in the above entitled cause fix the penalty at death. There were no tears. Scott Peterson showed no emotion. Uh, very, very stoic, very somber in that courtroom. I stagger my head. I had no idea who's talking. I feel my feet on the floor. I feel the chair I'm sitting in. My vision was even a little blurry because I just had this weird sensation. That uh, was falling forward and forward and down, and there was going to be no end to this falling forward and down. Like there was no floor to land on. Now, obviously, Scott Peterson is a liar. He's a cheater. He's a sketchball. A lot of people think he's a sociopath. But I have always had trouble with this verdict. Like it eats me inside. And. Oh, because I'm pretty sure he did it, like 90% sure. But there's that 10% of me that's like, maybe he didn't. And the dude's on death row? There's no physical evidence proving that Scott did this. It's all based on speculation. It's all based on the fact that he lied so much. Like, would he have been convicted if he didn't cheat? Someone cheating doesn't make them a killer, but his behavior is so weird that on the other hand, I mean, there's just so many weird things. But is there enough to say, oh yeah, 100% he did it and he should get the death penalty? To me, I don't think so like I know this is gonna be controversial and I'm not saying Scott Peterson should be free but I seriously don't know if he did it like I don't think you can bank on that 100% because there's still a chance that it really was those burglars across the street I mean that just throws a huge wrench in things I mean I think it's very possible Lacey was out walking her dog saw them robbing the house said something or looked at them or did something and they decided to kidnap her and they could have dumped her body in the same bay you know now I'm saying they could have I'm not sure what really happened obviously and that's what makes this so hard because you obviously don't want someone to like just be let go when you are pretty fucking sure they killed their wife but at the same time like uh what if he didn't do it his whole family believes he didn't do it and Scott still to this day maintains that he didn't do it and then something really weird happened a woman named Lourdes Avila. She had a clothing store and she was also eight months pregnant. She said for about 30 minutes that two men watched her from across the street and they were really, really creeping her out. And then she said that one of the guys got out of his car and went into her store. She ran to the back, called police, and to this day, she believes that those two men are the ones who are responsible for killing Lacey and that they were going after pregnant women. Another thing that was discovered during the appeals process was a handwritten log from the mailman. Their mailman 
his name was Russell Graybill, and he delivered their mail every day from about 10.35 to 10.50. And they're able to determine this time because he's scanning mail and they can see the timestamps. And when he was at their house, he said he noticed that the gate was open and that the dog wasn't in the yard because normally the dog barked at the mailman, shocking. But he wasn't there. So if this is true, this suggests that Lacey was killed after 10.18 when the other neighbor claims to have put the dog back in the yard. Sounds like a lot of people are confused, but can you blame them? It must be so hard to figure out what time you were doing stuff. I don't know what time I did anything. I don't even know what time I woke up today. Like remembering something down to the minute when you're not sure at the time that you're gonna have to remember it, it's just very hard. So Scott obviously appealed the sentence. In 2012, they filed a 423 page appeal. So there were three parts of the trial that they were going to appeal. The first part of the appeal was the selection process of the jury. The judge made a decision that if a jury said that they were against the death penalty, he would automatically release them. And they basically argued that this wasn't fair. The second part was referring to the prosecution and them feeling like they were using tactics and methods that just weren't fair, such as using dogs that don't have certification. Not only that, but they also had a hydrologist, and this is someone who studies water, the movement of water, distribution of water, that kind of thing. And it was later found out that this guy had never had any formal education. Whoops. And the third part of the appeal was evidence that the defense never got to share with the jury. They actually weren't able to show the experiment of them throwing the 100 pound weight off the boat. Moving forward to August 10th of 2017, the state attorney general filed a response to the appeal that was 150 pages long. It basically was disputing most of the claims and saying that the appeal ignored overwhelming evidence that Scott murdered Lacey. And Scott's case is actually still on appeal under the Supreme court. And even though he was given the death penalty, he's still alive with no plans or no date to execute him because it's very, very rare for people to actually get executed, especially in California. They haven't done it since like 2006. So it's quite possible that he'll never be executed, that he'll just die of natural causes in prison. And what's kind of weird is that death row is actually way better for prisoners than like county prison is. It's a lot nicer. There's a show called I Am A Killer on Netflix. It just came out. It really explains this. So a few things to note after the trial of things that weren't really brought up. Even though Modesto is kind of painted to be a very sleepy town where nothing happens, it actually is not the safest place and crime there is pretty common. Between 1999 and 2002, seven pregnant women, including Lacey, disappeared from the area. One of them in particular was six months apart from Lacey. Her name was Evelyn Hernandez. She is sometimes referred to as the other Lacey Peterson because their cases are so similar. And she was found pretty much the same way that Lacey was. Her torso just washed up on the San Francisco Bay. And not to mention, she was nine months pregnant. So a lot of people think that there was a serial killer that was killing pregnant women specifically. Now, one thing that's really weird and pretty disturbing is that on Connor's ear, um, the unborn baby of Lacey, there was a little piece of electrical tape folded over his ear. And there was also something similar to a noose around his neck and chest. And this made people think that someone was handling the baby. Like, is there a serial killer who's taking the babies out of women? Which happens. It actually does happen. I know of a few cases. It's really scary. And I don't know if it's true. I don't know if Lacey had the same fate as those other women by the same people, but it definitely leaves me with enough reasonable doubt. And if I were a juror, I just could not convict Scott. As much as I feel like he did it and I feel like he's a piece of shit, there's not enough evidence. And the fact that there's other possibilities just really gets to me. Scott's family actually has created something called SPA, Scott Peterson Appeal. And Scott's whole family and other people that believe he's innocent, which is a lot of people, have dedicated their lives to freeing him. I am a timeliner. I've always been, I've always thought sequentially. The biggest part of what we have in the Scott office is a timeline of December 24th. That kind of takes over one wall. On the board, we just have a very, very small representation of some of the cards that we've received over the years. and. That kind of support is one of the things that's really kept our family going. When I, you know, sat down to kind of piece together his day, I, I was actually stunned. I, I mean, I was already stunned that he was convicted on death row, but then I was further stunned at how full his day was, how there was no contradiction in it, and how it could be perceived that he had any time to do criminal activity on this day. And I think, I think the verdict they made was an emotional verdict based on 
adultery evidence. His family basically thinks that Scott was accused of murder because of the way that the media portrayed him. That, you know, the cheating thing is what made them make that final decision. There's no scratches, there's no fiber evidence, there's no DNA, there's no blood evidence, there's no murder weapon, there's nothing. They felt like they just needed someone to blame for this, some closure for the public. And Scott's family is pretty convinced that the burglary may have had something to do with Lacey's disappearance. And they're also convinced that Lacey was alive on the 24th. We have an innocent brother on death row. I don't know if you can understand how Lee's holding up unless you understand this injustice. As much as us kids feel it, I don't even know that I can put myself in Lee's shoes as a parent or in Jackie's shoes as a parent or in Sharon's shoes as a parent. Scott needs a new trial and we need justice for Lacey and Connor and whoever did this to them is, is still out there. Scott Peterson murdered my daughter and his unborn child. If his sentence is converted to a life in prison, there's the possibility that he would someday be out on parole. And there's always the possibility that he might do this to somebody else. He is there for a reason. I believe with Prop 66, that if everything is expedited, the process is expedited, I think that will be more of a deterrent. Maybe somebody will think twice before they decide to murder somebody. And the victims of all of these killers need to have justice. Thank you. So this leaves me so confused. I want to know what you guys think. I hate even saying out of my mouth that maybe Scott isn't guilty because for so long I just was like slam dunk he is until I got older and I learned more about you know the jury system and court and just what you need in order to convict someone and I just have trouble with the fact that this guy's on death row and there's just not enough evidence that he did it. I'm sure a lot of you out there are dead set that Scott did it and I'm like 90% with you. There's just that 10% of me that's like maybe he did it. So I want to know what you guys think. Do you have any thoughts on this? Do you think Scott's innocent? Do you think he's guilty? Well, there's innocent and guilty and then there's like court innocent and guilty. You know, like you can think someone's guilty and not have enough to give them a guilty sentence. What do you think happened? What do you think should have happened in court? And what do you think about Scott appealing this or the death penalty? I want to know your guys' thoughts on this because I know it's going to be very controversial. This case really gets to me. It's kept me up so many nights. It's just one that I've followed for so long and it drives me completely nuts. I just want to say, you know, my thoughts go out to Lacey's family. I'm not sure they'll ever see this. I'm sure they're so sick of hearing about it, talking about it. They've pretty much stayed out of the media and I don't blame them at all. But I'm just so, so sorry for them. I feel just terrible. This beautiful woman, such a nice woman, was taken from them, especially carrying their first grandchild. I mean, it's just heartbreaking and I think about them all the time. I really, really do. But that's all I have for you guys. I hope you enjoyed this double feature. Be sure to give it a thumbs up if you did and you want to see more two-part videos. That is all I have for you today, guys. Be sure to let me know your thoughts and I will see you next time. Where'd you go? Seems like it's been forever. Where'd you go?